So hello, uh, welcome to the Fabian Bias podcast, uh, episode one, new venture that I'm starting. And uh, while I have some experience with this, this is the first time doing this uh, as this new show. And, you know, to use, a, you know, Michael is a football guy. I'm a football guy as well to kind of use an, uh, kind of a metaphor, maybe coming out on first and 10 and, you know, hitting a big play right away. We got the one and only Michael Sartain, who's a world-class performance coach uh, and he has an, a really incredible background. So I'm really, I'm just super honored, excited to to have you on here, Michael. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy. No, this is great, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank you. You know, a couple now obviously have quite a few things I, I definitely look forward to discussing with you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service. I mean, I think- I appreciate that, it. Yeah, that I think that's so important. The, the 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 people that are brave enough and and serve this country, this great country, it has its nothing is without flaws. But I think you know by far, you know we are blessed to be in this country, the United States of America. Of America and uh, while there are a lot of things going on, we're we're incredibly blessed to be here. I wanted to ask you, Michael, because I've heard you speak about your time in the military in the past. What was the main driver that motivated you to join the military? And I know you were you're a retired captain of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so uh, it was I was working in a strip club uh, called the Yell or called uh, sh what was it called Expose on Congress Avenue in um, Austin, Texas. And I came to work and I watched the towers fall. And at first, when the first tower fell, I was like, oh man, I'm sure everybody got out of there. When the second tower fell and we saw what was going on, we realized it was a terrorist attack. And and then I'm thinking like 50,000 people are going to die, right? They're going to be without yeah. power, you know, all these people in New York. I, th I thought it was going to be something like that. It's crazy. Um, and I remember the next, the the following weeks, um, my, two of my frat brothers, uh, Marcus Cole and Antonio Edwards, both joined the military. Now, they had, actually, Cole, Marcus had already joined before 9-11. Uh, but they were both aviators. Marcus was in the Navy sure. and Antonio was in the Marine Corps. And so, you know, I, it was one of these things where it was, I just felt called to, to join the military after 9-11. But I will tell you, like, it, there was another, you know, more selfish reason, which is uh, I was, I, I, I can't remember if I met Tony Q before or after this, but there was this DJ who worked at a strip club that I met and he had put like two of his daughters through college from working at a strip club. And he had just been in the same position for 16 years, something like that. No, more than that, like 30 years. Yeah. He was like pretty morbidly overweight uh, and he was making really good money and he would just like flirt with the girls all the time. And I just realized like if I stayed where I stayed, this this guy was going to be me. Like mm -hmm. his life was comfortable enough to where he never wanted to leave it. And um, it was one of these things where I was just sitting there thinking, like my life was really easy at the time. And I was like, I don't want, I want more of a challenge. You know, I have a degree from UT Austin. I like to make my family proud. My prep family had no idea that I was working at a gentleman's club at the time. Uh, and by the way, just so we're clear, if you guys back go to 99, 2000, 99 is the end of the dot-com bubble, 2000, and there's a crash of a one after 9-11 happens, there's no jobs for MIS majors back then. So me working at a strip club was actually like good money compared to what I could have been making and what right. some of my friends were making. They were getting fired. So, you know, it, it's um that's why I ended up uh, doing that. And But I, you know, joined the military uh, initially I wanted to be an intelligence officer, ironically at the end of my career, I worked in Intel. I wasn't an Intel officer, uh, but, um, they told me, you know, if you want to join, you're going to be a navigator because we need more, more navigators. And so I had scored enough, high enough on the pilot navs portion to where I could be an aviator. Um, I had to take the whole test twice because they lost it the first time. I think, I actually think it's a, I think it's a test. I think deliberately recruiters lose all of your information uh, because they want to see how serious you are about going through the whole thing again. I, I do, I, looking back on it, I'm starting to think it was a test. Yeah. Like some of the things they were putting me through to see how serious I was about joining the military. Um, and when I look it back in retrospect, the long shot of me becoming a, an Air Force officer after like, you know, managing a strip club is crazy. Like the probability that is so insanely low. Um, so, you know, I ended up joining and um, I tell you, I was a good navigator. I was a pretty good leader and I was not a great officer. Uh, that's something I look back in and uh, retrospect and those are lessons I try to learn from where there was a lot of diligence and 
uh, delayed gratification that I just didn't want to give up in my early 20s. Um, I, I was a good navigator. Like I knew what I was doing in the aircraft and I was a good instructor. And I think in a lot of cases, I was a good leader, uh, especially in some of the training courses we did, but I don't think I was a great officer. Like, I, I just think there was some diligence issues that I had that I, I've since tried to work on since I've gotten out of the military. But uh, um, the lessons I learned are, there's no master's degree. There's no PhD that you can learn to tell you, to give you lessons of being a military officer for seven years. I, I can imagine now in terms of, and you actually read my mind because my next question was what was something that you learned uh that you learned uh from the from the air force that you weren't expecting that kind of helped you down the oh, road yeah. yeah the the i wasn't expecting it and it's definitely the number one thing i learned uh while i was in the military is the difference between good leadership and bad leadership uh i just you know the two execs that are on my company right now we just had a meeting right before this and we all talked about how we can be better leaders one of the things I consistently do is uh, because I, you know I'm the face of the company and I and I do the majority of the fulfillment and I handle the, the organic is that I, I spend a significant portion of my day fulfilling. So when guys go on sales calls and uh, they have a guy who's like on the fence and they don't believe that there's accessibility to me because they think I'm too busy, I will jump on the call like during the sales call. Yeah. Uh, if you're the size of um, if you're the size of Grant Cardone, or even if you're the size of Ryan Pineda, you can't, you just can't do that. You just don't have the time to jump on everyone's sales calls. I make the time to do so. And if I can't, I make loom videos because it's a better way for me to serve my sales team. And what I always want my sales team to feel like, and all the other teams in the pro program is that I'm here to serve you. Mm -hmm. um, as, as your, as your, the CEO, I'm here to serve you. That was something I learned in the dichotomy of leadership by Jacko Willick and Leif Babin. That's something I learned in extreme ownership. That's something I learned in can't hurt me uh, by uh, David Goggins. It's something, you know, these leadership components are just so incredibly important. And those books really solidified these lessons that I learned while I was in the military. I watched two, I had one uh, squadron commander get fired uh, because she just wouldn't take responsibility for what she was doing. And I, I feel like she was a bit underqualified for the job. And to, to a certain extent, she wasn't a great pilot. Um, yeah. and it was disappointing because her and I went to the same university. And so she, I was kind of like her favorite, uh, but she, you know, it was just, I, it was very clear to me, the difference between her and the other commanders where it was like the other commanders were, I am here to serve. Nothing else matters than me serving. And like, at no point, the last thing I want to do is command people. Uh, but, but, you know, having that, uh, that ability to do that is something I learned. And also everyone doesn't have to like you. Uh, I try to make everyone like me in my company. Um, and I, it's a little easier for me to do that because there are bad guys. I have guys who I pay to be the bad guys in my company. Uh, you know, they're the ones I don't do the firing personally, like for instance, as the CEO, uh, and I don't, ha I don't hand out discipline. Another guy does that right. and he's comfortable in that role. And I'm, I'm comfortable being the grandfather or the, or the uncle who comes and tries to spoil the grandkids. Like that's, you know, that's my role. Um, Okay. So that's, you know, and that's a great thing to find is if you can find two partners or more that fill the different roles of, uh, they talk about an e-myth revisited, the manager, the entrepreneur, and the technician, you know, that's, that's a really great thing to do. You know, I'm closer to Steve Wozniak than Steve Jobs. I, Steve Wozniak was a board member at Apple while at the same time working in the engineering department, while Steve Jobs was a board member at Apple at the same time working as their CEO. So I'm actually closer to Steve Wozniak. Like I'm, I'm just operating. I'm an operator in fulfillment while at the same time, um, yeah. while at the same time, uh, you know, being a, a, a an equity owner in the company. And at yeah. at some point, I fully intend on hiring a CEO to replace me. Sure, sure. Yeah, and you're starting out, and and you're growing into it. And I know firsthand. I have experience with your phenomenal program, Men of Action, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And I have to say, uh, one thing that it 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 surprised me for the moment, but then I got it right away because you're you're you lead with service first, and I thought that was that was really phenomenal. And I've had I've interacted with several people on your team, and they're great guys as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you've you've really come to, and you've shared a couple of books. I mean, I've I've I know I my, I've learned so much just from your content and your recommendations and so forth. You talk a lot about and you teach. You've lived it, and now you're you're you've been teaching it, and now you're teaching it uh, through your program. So for your your daily content, just navigating high status social circles, and and also and probably even 
step, taking a step back, having a clear understanding of psychology, evolutionary psychology, you talk a lot about that. Could you share just, hey, guys watching this, you know, I have no idea what he's talking about. What the hell is evolutionary psychology and how does that play into where we are, you know, and as as we navigate our lives as men in, in this day and age? So the best way to understand evolutionary psychology is just to work backwards and work backwards up to where we are now. So let's go to a beginning point. So for this discussion, we could have a beginning point of mammals, which is about 178 million years ago, a beginning point of hominids, which would include Homo habilis, Homo erectus, all these other hominids, that would be about 3 million years ago. Or and, or we could look at the, the origin of Homo sapiens, which is the species we belong to. Uh, that would be about 200,000 years ago. Um, the question you have to ask yourself is, so there's probably points during our evolutionary history where survival was very, very tough. No electricity, no running water, uh, no medical care services. You're basically on your own. No one's going to come to save you. And you live in a tribe of about 150 people. During those uh, time periods, you have to realize that in a kid, there's not even 50,000 humans on the planet at one point. You have to imagine at that time period... Uh, uh, if uh, there was a plague or if there was a predator or something like that, it could wipe out the entire species. And if you look, there's 14 other species of hominid that have been wiped out, including Homo neanderthalis and Homo habilis and Homo australis. They were all wiped out. So everything that we have with us today was some was a tool in our toolkit that aided us in survival back during that ancestral period. If you can start from understanding that that conclusion I just gave you is totally inescapable, that that must be true, because it must be true, um, then you understand, okay, fear of snakes, fear of heights, fear of spiders, prefer women with symmetrical faces and a certain hip to waist ratio. Women prefer men with a shoulder to waist ratio. Uh, the women, women prefer men taller than them. Resource acquisition, all these kind of things, uh, paternity, uncertainty. You realize, okay, these things all came from our ancestors. And so the, like for instance, humans don't eat poop. Uh, the humans that may have existed that ate poop, they all died of dysentery or whatever the fuck, and they did not pass on their genes. Men who were not a little bit jealous and somewhat mate guarding of their of their wives, of their mates, ended up raising other people's uh, children. So the men who were more, it, it's really funny because this is part of Sexy Sons hypothesis, men who were more promiscuous and slept with more women and at the same time were more jealous of other men being around their their girlfriends, they pass on their genetics more. It's an inescapable conclusion. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it is an inescapable conclusion. If if the thing that the proclivity keeps causing that uh, phenotype to, to have more children, then that proclivity is going to get passed on through evolution. And so since like 200,000 years of evolution is enough, to be fair, like monkeys are also afraid of snakes. Like there's a lot of things between other primates and, and other mammals in general. If you put fire in front of a cat, it's going to run away. Like there's certain things that um, as mammals, we kind of all have in common. We jump at loud noises. We tend to have a fear of heights, et cetera. Um, you know, we can smell foul odors like sulfur and we don't want to be around them. So when you, when you come to those realizations, then you start to say, ask the question, okay, which one of my preferences or proclivities come from evolution and which one of them come from culture. And then you dig even deeper and you come up to this really scary Fabian, uh, you come to this really scary realization, Fabian, which is all of them do. All, every single every single proclivity we have is based in evolution. And then you're like, well, but no culture this and culture that. And you'll see this with movies that try to cr promote a more egalitarian nature. And by the way, I'm not, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that. I'm very much in favor of you know, I think women should vote and and I believe in, in civil rights. Like I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. What I'm telling you is that it was not innate in our design for those things. What happened was culture elevated us as a species to where we could accomplish those goals. But the problem is culture then tries to do things like make, you know, for instance, body positivity is a situation and I'm, I'm not shaming body positivity. But what I am saying is it's okay to accept someone because they're overweight, but it's not okay to tell me as a man that I need to find them attractive because that defies my evolution. And so that's where, you know, I kind of draw the line with, with certain aspects of that. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of what I, uh, what I just said is um, when, when you come to the realization that you can basically look at every situation with humans through an evolutionary lens and you can usually find the answer. In fact, I really haven't found a situation where I haven't found the answer. Every single question when it comes to evolution, I can find some theory that at least, you know, mostly explains it. There's a few things that are a little confusing, uh, but for the most part, it's uh, it's it's one of the most top as far as psychology goes. Psychology is what's called a soft science, meaning there's a lot of theories, 
Most of them aren't tested. People could do way more studies, but it's a very fungible, very like vague science, except this one area of psychology called evolutionary psychology, where they're consistently looking for hard data, no matter where the data takes them. And often it takes them to very ugly places, which is why it's not a broadly accepted branch of psychology. And you also you often see people on YouTube saying evolutionary psychology is bigoted. No, it's just a psychology. It's just a science. The science leads us to where it leads us. I'll give you an example. Um, there's one study by an evolutionary psychologist where he looked at the success of on dating apps based on what your race was. Uh, and, and so, you know, the egalitarian would be like, either don't look this data up or everyone should receive the exact same amount of right swipes based on their, uh, based on their race. And of course, that wasn't the truth. He published the study and he was absolutely eviscerated for it. He found that Asian men and African-American women do the worst on dating apps. Then he published a study and he lost his tenure and he, he, he ran for the hills after that. So it's one of these things where in evolution, we just kind of try to figure out in evolutionary studies, if there's an ugly truth, which the truth is guys, sorry, there is no free will. And we are hairless murder apes. Um, once you come to these realizations, it's ugly. So evolutionary psychology also does not receive widespread acc acclaim because liberals don't like it. Liberal, because evolutionary psychology clearly defines gender roles and conservatives don't like it because it's evolution. And a lot of them don't believe in evolution. So right. it, it has no political backing. Uh, the psychology community doesn't like it. Right. Uh, it's very ugly. Uh, it's, it's one of these things that it's just one of these uncouth things you shouldn't be talking about at the dinner table. Right. And it's also completely factual. Right. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of the the dating scene and relationships in the U.S. and how that the uh, psychology plays into that, and will you know because you you share a lot through your podcast, your weekly podcast, the the uh, mentorship that you provide. You mentioned dating apps, you know, as a as a guy, and and kind of you know banned from a couple apps and and not striking out a lot on apps and so forth is it a, it's it is it essentially a rigged game is it is it like a stack deck that most men will lose uh it's it's not it may negligently be rigged but it's not nefariously rigged meaning i don't think it's deliberately rigged i just yeah. think it's a function of evolution whereas yeah. we've given uh both genders this perceived dilemma of choice women a dilemma of choice because of social media uh because of dating apps and because of things like only fans and men a dilemma of choice when they watch pornography or sedate themselves in other ways like that by messaging women they have no chance with on on social media apps and also from seeing images of women that have been doctored using face app facetune lightroom Photoshop, and then believing that women look like that in real life, which often they don't. I got news for you. I live out here in Vegas in LA. I see these girls in person. They're pretty, but they don't look like the photos. Um, and so men and women often end up with these delusional beliefs and they have a perceived choice, a perceived delusional choice that isn't real. And what I mean by that is women will often left swipe on a man and in her mind think that because at one point she had sex with a super attractive man or a professional athlete or a rapper or a movie star, she thinks that now that man that she just left swiped on, not only is he beneath what she's capable of getting, but she could have easily, if she wanted to get that man to commit to her. And that's obviously not true. Right. Women, the, the, the issue with women where their, their issues are is they are absolutely correct in who they could have sex with. They're usually no to a pretty good extent who they could have sex with. And they are delusional for lack of a better, better term. And I use the word delusional because here's reality. Okay. Here's base reality. And he, here is, you, what you believe about reality and they are, there's a delta in between them. There's a difference in between those two things. That difference is delusion. Okay. I, I know a lot of people don't like when I say, use the word delusion because they find it to be chauvinistic, but I say m men are delusional also. Yeah. Uh, women are, when it comes to short-term dating, women are absolutely accurate. They believe they could fuck certain guys and they can fuck those guys. When it comes to long-term dating, they are absolutely delusional. And as they get older, the men that they can actually get to settle down into long-term relationships lessens, but they don't recognize that it lessens because, you know, once they burnt 28, 29, 30, they actually feel more, more empowered. And they get to this point where uh, they're starting to notice that the guys that they could have got locked down at 23, they're now trying to lock down at 31. And that same guy is not interested in the, in the girl. It, it's like, she's still attractive at 31. It's just, he's looking at her 23 year old sister and being like, right. yeah, I'd rather be with her. You right. know, there's less, less baggage, fewer bodies. Right. That I have to deal with. 
And right. so because of that, what's happened is because of this dilemma of choice, women will, I, I read one statistic, I believe it's 16,000 swipes for 10 dates for women. Women are not going on dating apps to date. They're going on dating apps for attention. Men are going dating apps for sex. There's about six guys for every girl on dating apps. And when you look at the, the probabilities here, what you're going to find is, um, you know, 80% of the men on these dating apps are deemed unattractive by women, 20% are deemed attractive and four and a half percent are deemed so attractive that women will actually pursue them. If you're in that top four and a half percent, the, the, the game is actually rigged in your favor. If you're not part, if you're part of the top 20%, the game is like, you, you might have to put a little bit of work. If you're in that top 20%, you probably should buy those boosts on Tinder and Bumble and Hinge, you know, to boost your account. If you're in the, if you're in the bottom 80%, it doesn't make any difference how many boosts you buy. You're not going to, you're just going to get like more matches, but you're going to get more matches from girls trying to get you to go down their OnlyFans funnel or, you know, straight up sugar that's, babies or prostitutes. That's and what so it that's, is. is yeah, it's a lot yeah, of a lot funneling of funneling for that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, going back to what I said, male delusion comes from right swiping on attractive women on dating apps and getting a match when those girls are really just trying to get you to follow them on Instagram or uh, trying to get you to go down their own OnlyFans yeah. funnel delusion comes from women when they start believing that all these men that they're left swiping on, they could actually be in a relationship with like any of them. Most of them, they can't be. Now, the very attractive women definitely can. I'm not saying that's not the case. What I'm saying is women can always find someone to commit to them long term. It's just, are those women, will are, will those women be attracted to those same men? The answer is usually no, uh, because most women don't find most men attractive. Most right. women don't like most men most of the time. Right. For men who are have been struggling uh dating and have turned to you know sure I, I don't know what the percentage is maybe michael you you have some data on that but in terms of the number of men that regularly visit porn sites uh of and check out those huh what do you um, think i mean it, it's going to be a really high number uh, i i just it's it's so there's two different there's two different forces here one is the force of sedation which is the video games uh, the pornography and the, um, and I, I'll be the first to admit, I had a problem with video games and pornography while I was in the military and I was deployed for a long time or and not even deployed when I was in places like Warner Robins, Georgia or Wichita, Kansas, there just wasn't enough for me to do socially. So I had a problem with it. And it's just something that I worked through. I'll tell you the, the biggest, the best solution to a problem with pornography is to have a really hot young girlfriend who wants sex three times a day. All of a sudden pornography problem just right. vanishes. It's gone. You got the um, real thing now. Yeah. 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 It just, it just woof, all of a sudden no, no <laughs> pornography issue. Fuck anymore. Porn. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, it's one of these situations where, uh, you know, when you, when you get into that, uh, that place, uh, where you're, you're addicted to pornography or you're using the sedation of video games or use, using the sedation is a big one of alcohol, big one in the military is definitely a big one. Are you using the sedation of like, say Oxycontin or maybe Adderall or something like that to take away like, uh, Oh, I have a bad feeling about a thing. Therefore I need to smoke marijuana. Smoking marijuana, I don't think is anywhere near as bad as some of those other things. But if you only smoke marijuana to get rid of your anxiety, then your body's natural ability to get rid of anxiety lessens. Mm -hmm. So um, what was the original question? So I'm in terms of just the, the well, a part oh, the, of the it, amount of men on the, the amount of yeah. men that are on these, these apps. Okay. So one of the forces is the sedation and the other force is the lack is the lack of improvement. So in order for you to get out of this place where you can have a beautiful girlfriend who wants to be with you as men, we always have to perform. If there's anything that your audience should take from this, men, we always have the burden of performance. Women often have a burden of performance. Like for instance, if a woman is a female fighter pilot or she's the mayor of a city or she's a cardiologist, those women definitely have a burden of performance. But men, but there are some women that don't have a burden of performance. They have a situation where their performance is, you know, to stay at home with the kids or they have a sugar daddy or something to that effect, or they make money on OnlyFans. Their burden of performance is nowhere near that of a man, whereas all men have a burden of performance. Unless you are, uh, you know, born with a silver spoon in your lap, mouth or incredibly good looking. And even then, it, being incredibly good looking doesn't help a, a man to the extent that it helps a woman. If you had if you had a son and a daughter and you had one that was tall and one that was good looking, it's always better for the man to be taller and the woman to be good looking versus the other way around where the woman is tall and the man is good looking. And you just get less for it, you know? Yeah. So like the earning power for Shaquille O'Neal's daughter who's tall versus his son who's tall is about 100x, right? For her, for the, her his son. Right. So when you when you realize those proclivities, um I lost train of thought again. We're, oh yeah, we're talking yeah. about um about the the simping thing. So 
basically one of the forces is is the sedation and the other force is the lack of discipline and the lack of delayed gratification necessary to improve yourself because on one hand it's like i have this incredible like any porn thing i can think of anything i can imagine is just there for me right but on the other hand what what i need to do to improve myself it's got to be the gym i personally think 5 days a week i know some people say 3 i think 5 6 7 days a week is fine especially in the beginning I think you have to change your diet. I pr you know, prefer a paleo diet. If you have a weight problem, you may need to, uh, it's going to be a combination of cardio, possibly intermittent fasting, which sucks. Maybe you do something like 75 hard. Uh, I highly recommend for people to become more attractive, better networkers, and to become more charismatic that they read, that they read a ton, get through 20 books a year, use audible if you need to do that. Yeah. Um, and they need and to you're work saying on that. And you're saying that because you you can now strike up more interesting conversations yes. and be well more all, well, well it, rounded. It, but it's also going to change the way you think about things. You're going to right. be able to like model other way people's way of thinking uh, and be more empathetic to other people, which also is going to make you a better conversationalist. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, great point. So so working on charisma. So that's just back and forth with people for a long time. Uh, working on um, your networking skills. And then, at, and then all of those things together are going to make you much better at dating. And then I also think as men, you know, we talked about a burden performance, men do need experience when it comes to dating. Men need to be able to discern, uh, you know, was it, it poison uh, that she's got a big ass and a smile? That girl is poison. Like you, you can't, that, that song is about red flags just because she was attractive. Therefore I ignore the red flags. Men need experience in order to get past that because the urge for sexual validation in men is so incredibly strong. Yeah. So Women, on the other hand, don't need experience when it comes to dating. What they need instead is like a friend group that can tell them, hey, this guy you're dating is abusive or a narcissist or whatever. It is really amazing to me how many problems women have in their dating life that could easily be solved by a male family member or an older male friend or a plutonic male friend or a female friend who's been in a happy, uh, successful relationship, just examining their relationship from a third party, uh, par party standpoint and giving them better advice. It's that's, incredible that's, to yeah. me how often, it, it, but the problem is whenever I give women proper advice, like, hey, just to let you know, like, do whatever you want, but like, you do understand this guy is a DJ in Las Vegas. He is going to fuck other women behind your back. I don't care what he tells you. And her response is, no, I'm going to change him. He's going to be my boyfriend. And well, of course she's it, hurt six right. months later because not the, everything I said was true and everything she said was based on her feelings. Right. When you, when you that's come it. to that realization, like that's one of the issues, you know, that's one of the issues that happens is had she had a male family member or a male plutonic friend that she would listen to about from a third party about her relationships, she would actually be able to be more successful in relationships. So women don't need more experience when it comes to dating. Men do. That Great points there, Michael, which you kind of, I don't know how you're doing it. You're, you're, I don't know you guys, you're, you're kind of going right into some of the follow-up questions that I have. Women, well, you said earlier, women tend to be delusional right a lot of times and they 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 obviously they're they're emotional so a lot of times they while you may offer them some advice for their benefit they may take it chances are they won't but yet women are naturally better uh more socially calibrated than men you'd say yes women are approached uh women right now like a, an average 22 year old woman is approached more an attractive one especially is a approached more in her life than I will ever be in my entire life. Right. She'll be approached more by the time she's 22 than I will be approached by other human beings in my entire life. So women's social calibration is higher. They also just have a natural ability to read facial expressions that are better than men. They also have a better sense of smell like it, than men. Like there's the th a ton of things that women are just capable of doing. I believe women are better at sussing out ho social hierarchies than men are. Um, and so from that standpoint, what does that mean? That means if you're a phony, women are going to be able to, to, to seek it out. Now there's ways around it. Men have evolved adaptations in order to get around some of those um, defenses that women have. Like, well, like love bombing would be a great example of mm -hmm. one. And just like deceit, deceit, just straight out deceit. Yes, honey, I'll see you when you get back from work and then you just go have an affair. Like that's deceit is another thing that men have an adaptation to do. Women do too, by the way, all humans yeah. have the adaptation to deceive. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a situation where like the more you learn about the actual, the actual psychological hardware, firmware in your brain that comes from evolutionary adaptations, um, and then, and you just accept those things and understand that they're true, no matter how ugly they are, the closer you will be to the truth. Okay.
I want to ask you regarding, because you, you shared some great insights around men bettering themselves, getting in better shape, so forth. Uh, let's say, for example, I've, I've, uh, you've spoken about this in past uh, uh, interviews, so forth. So men that are older, you know, 30s, 40s, so forth, and uh, maybe low low energy levels. You talked sometimes about uh, TRT. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about th what that is for someone that doesn't know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I know obviously there's not medical advice yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So the the only advice I can give you is to go to a TRT doctor and then have your levels checked. What I'm going to tell you are hypotheticals that could be happening to you. Um, in order for you to achieve like certain, regardless of what the world tells you, most women find masculine traits in most men to be attractive, more attractive than feminine traits. I know there's, oh my God, Machine Gun Kelly and Harry Styles are attractive. I get what you're doing. You're saying here, those men still have super high status, even though they're not super masculine, but having masculine traits and masculine boundaries for the most part, no matter what society tells you is what most women find attractive in men. Okay. They want a man who could fight better than them, is stronger than them, is taller than them. It makes more money than them. If you ask women, do you want a man who's more intelligent than you? Most women will say yes. Do you want a man who makes a lot more money than you? Most women will say yes. Do you want a, want a man who can provide for you so that you can stay at home with the kids and not work? 83% of women surveyed who were in the workforce said yes, that is what they wanted. Uh, so, you know, regardless of how you feel about that, um, uh, having that, uh, you know, men having the ability to lead or women wanting men like that is what's most important. R restate the question one more time. So in terms of uh, if someone wanted to they were suffering with low energy levels so forth and yeah, yeah. they were looking into TRT. Right. So, so maintaining those masculine boundaries, one of the things you need to do is have a certain level of focus and energy and stoicism. Uh, and those things often come from your, the fact that men have more testosterone than women. Uh, there's a point at which I, I see, I have some clients, I have, you know, a client right now, he's in, he just turned 40 and uh, I gave him some news that was pretty accurate about his life. And he looked like he was about to cry. Um, and then the first thing I thought is, bro, we got to get your levels checked. Like we have to get your levels checked. There's no way you like, it was not something you should be crying about, right? Gets his levels checked in the two hundreds. That's what's going on. As excessive amounts of estrogen, body fat, aromatizes testosterone into estrogen. Again, I'm not saying you guys need to take tests. What I'm telling you though, is you need to go to a TRT doctor and there could be several reasons why you feel the way you feel. Why basically for lack of a better term, you're acting like a bitch, but the the one way that we can't that you can't handle on your own is your is your endocrine system. There are certain herbs that you can take that will boost your testosterone levels, and I would recommend people research those and try those before you get on TRT. But there's uh, there's also a limit to where you know you're just older and your just body's not producing testosterone like it used to, and so going to a clinic again, going to a clinic having testosterone and estrogen levels checked. Watch what will happen. You guys will listen to me. You'll go to a urologist. Uh, or you'll go to an endocrinologist and they'll check your testosterone levels. They'll be low. They'll tell you, well, you're in normal limits. They won't check your estrogen levels and they'll just send you on your merry way. That's why I said, I did not say go to a urologist. I did not say go to an endocrinologist. I said, go to a TRT specialist and have them run tests on you. It's really important. Thank you for that. That's it's really important. In terms of um, men that want to now, okay, they want to get in better shape. They're going to, let's say, and again, I'm, because I'm a little older, I'm going to, I'm kind of speaking for, to, for, in case maybe they're older guys, thirties, forties, fifties, so forth, that are, that could be, that'll, that'll be watching this. You're watching your diet, you're, you're getting, you're working out, you're, you're going to a TRT specialist. So now you're getting in better shape. Maybe you're, you're fixing your wardrobe, so forth. How do you go about attracting hotter women in your life what, what would you say and and then also you're you're he's reading more he's doing mm -hmm. those things yeah you know you're getting maybe like you talk about getting a relevant haircut you know there's yeah. i mean there's there's a lot of things there but a lot of things to do but in terms of putting yourself yes. out there because dating apps or chances are yeah. you know it's it's yeah. probably not going to work so starting from the base level, one of the things you need to understand is like, what are attraction triggers with women? Most of the men who are having trouble with women. So uh, men just need attraction in order to have sex. Men do not need context. They don't need comfort. Men don't have a seduction process. They see an attractive woman and they're just ready to go. And this is the same for other species of, of mammals. It's not just human males. Um, 
Women, on the other hand, need a, there's a seduction process that goes along with them or a comfort process that goes along with their attractiveness. What I'll tell you is that most men don't have a problem with the comfort issue. They have a problem with, that's why guys get put in the friend zone because you're too comfortable. What men have, most men who come to me and most men who you're discussing and most of these men who are in like the bottom quartile who are really having no luck with women at all, what they have is an attraction problem. There are attraction triggers, attraction cues that women have towards men learn them and then adopt them regardless of how you feel about them. That's the answer, right? So again, uh, I, I see people uh, criticizing FedEx fearless because he brushes his tongue, right? Then he does this skincare routine and they say he's trying too hard or doing too much. Well, he's doing too much and he's fucking your girlfriend. That's what's going on because he has adopted things that he knows to be attraction triggers in women. One of the easiest attraction triggers to adopt is one called pre-selection, where it, it women have this perceived, this you have this perceived value to women, them believing that other women find you attractive. And so how do you do that? I like to do it uh, and teach my clients to do it by showing, having photos showing compliance from other women. It doesn't have to show necessarily like sexual attraction. There's no groping that goes on. There's no lascivious behavior, but there's a bunch of girls that are pretty, that are turned in towards you and they're smiling and they've got their arms around you. That is a, that's what's called compliance photo, which can display pre-selection. Pre-selection comes from the concept of mate choice copying in evolutionary psychology. Basically in a two gender species, the females see a male that's surrounded by other females. And then they find that male more attractive. We see that with women, it's the boy band effect. Women hear the, uh, the other females in the audience screaming for the boy band. So they become stimulated for the boy band as well. Right. And it's just, it's just, um, it's always funny. It's like an avalanche. It's really like the, the more you get understand pre-selection, the more outstandingly effective it is. So other traction triggers would be physical appearance. Well, most of us, we can't change our hair color and our height, but you know, maybe if you need hair plugs, a beard transplant, there's nothing wrong with that. I would highly recommend veneers if anyone is considering getting them, having a skincare routine where you wash your face and moisturize your face every day. If you're trying to grow a beard, use beard oil, try to, uh, you know, getting a ball fade on the sop side and having a beard that's tailored correctly can accentuate your jawline, which makes you look more masculine. There's people who have uh, chew gum, specifically they'll chew sugar-free gum all day to make to to strengthen their jaw muscles to make their jaw look more accentuated. Losing body fat, getting before before 14, getting lower than 14% body fat. What does that do? It makes your waist significantly smaller and it makes your waist smaller than your shoulder, your waist width less than your shoulder width. And what women find most attractive is about 1.65 to one. Uh, a shoulder to waist ratio. So the the shoulders are about 65% wider than the waist. And the best way to do that is by losing body fat. Um, so uh, having a V-shaped torso, uh, women also find uh, in higher, higher proportions, upper body muscle in men to be way more attractive. For physical, for attraction cues for men, one of the fastest ones you can do is upper body muscle. It really is an attraction cue for a lot of women. Now, not too much, but just where you have some proportionality, or maybe I would be slightly above average as far as upper body muscle. You don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but slightly above average where you look like you can handle yourself. Uh, another attraction triggers like might be one, a, a man's ability to fight. I know women are uh, attracted to MMA fighters, uh, comedy, intelligence, social alignments. Um, we've already gone over height and looks. Yeah. Um, there's a charisma. Um and there's also access, access to scarce resources. Like I, I know some guys who just basically either have a yacht. I know one guy who was passing out the wristbands on stage at one of the nightclubs who slept with a ton of women doing that. One guy who just maybe has a, run, a yacht rental agency and he just got a, a, a spare yacht he can take out every weekend and invites a bunch of girls out. These guys, because they have more access to women, more access to scarce resources, those are things that can be attraction triggers or rather things that funnel attractive women into your life. And the, so learning what those are, listen to me one more time, learn what those attraction triggers are. That's what I teach in my program. And adopt those attraction triggers regardless of how you feel about them. Now, if the attraction trigger is something that's immoral, like for instance, lying to women or using cocaine or Molly to get women to sleep with you, I would not, I would not adopt those things. Mm -hmm. I think those things are overboard because of the morality issue. Yeah. But I also am fully aware that like I've more than 50 times in my life since, you know, probably, you know, I've been going out for what, 25, 26 years, uh, more than 50 times I've had a great conversation with a girl and her leave with some other dude. Cause he has blow cause he has cocaine. I'm more than 50 times it's happened. So even though I'm aware that is a, an attraction trigger an attraction cue, I'm not going to adopt that one. And you're a big proponent of 
men having female friends. And a lot of people yes. will say, listen, I'm, I'm not interested in the, being their friend. I just want to fuck mm -hmm. them. You know, you, mm -hmm. you have, you, you really teach having a team with yes. women on there. And so can you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, this is going to come off as arrogant, but there is absolutely no one in this community or any other community who says that men and women can't be friends or they don't want to have female friends who has the results that me or my clients have. Let me say that one more time. There is no one in this community I will put, we can put up the receipts if you want. There's no one in this community or any other community that says men and women can't be friends who has better results than myself or my clients. Nobody. And the reason why is because they've missed the point. They're correct in that you don't want to get friend zoned by women. They're incorrect in this idea that you can't be friends with women. It's okay to be friends with women. It's bad to be friend zoned by women. How do you become friends with women? Well, the easiest way is to friend zone them. And the, another way to do it is to say, I hey, am going to treat you just like I treat my guy friends. So for instance, my best friend in high school, we never had a conversation where I'm like, Hey bro, I like you, but I think we're just better off as friends. Cause I knew we weren't trying to fuck each other. We're both heterosexual men. Right. And so because of that, our, our friendship grew organically. I just say, do the same thing with women. The other thing I will highly recommend for you guys is to not give women uh, compliments or give women validation based on their physical attractiveness ever. Give it to them because, hey, man, thank you for coming in and supporting my charity event. Or, hey, that's really awesome. I saw that you paid off your house. Congratulations. Or congratulations on getting that new job. Don't like the thirst trap photos where their breasts are out or their butts are out. Like the photo, like make women understand that in order to get your intent and admiration, they have to work for it. They have to work for it. Now, with that being said, when you have relationships like that with lots of women, remember what I talked about the compliance photos and the pre-selection? It's very easy to do those because you're the guy who goes out to the club. You know, you set up a girlfriend, one of your female friends, her birthday and a, and a dinner comp. So you're going to dinner with 20 girls and then you walk into the fucking nightclub with 12 girls. You get a comp table right on the dance floor and every other girl in the place is like looking, who the fuck is this guy? And I, I'll tell you, this is, uh, you know, something I learned. It was like uh, like the sixth in Congress that, uh, in Austin. There was this nightclub there, just brand new nightclub. It was like the hottest club in the city. This is in 2000, 2001, somewhere around that area. And I go to the place and I go with like 10 girls that were strippers all in, Los, in, uh, in Austin. And I walked in, no intent to try to hook up with any of them. But while I was there, I just remember other girls coming up and just like talking to me and being like, why are these girls talking to me? Like, what's going on? Like, they're approaching me, not realizing at the time because I was so young, you know, I'm 23, 24 years old, that women seeing me with other women made them really interested in what was going on with me. Remember, women don't have imperfect, imperfect information. We do too as men, but the main information we look for is like, she's hot, right? That's the majority, especially initially, right. especially for short-term uh, right. uh, dating. But when we, the information we're looking for, for a woman, she's hot. We look, we see she's hot. That's the information we need. Is it all the information? No, she could still be crazy. She might have a disease. Uh, she might be carrying some baggage or uh, an ex-boyfriend who, who's a murderer. Right. Like there's some other uh, information, but 85% of the information we can quickly discern, look at her very quickly, less than one right. second. She's hot. Yes. Thumbs up. Right. For women, it's 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 much di more difficult for them. It's uh, one, because they're pickier than men. They have to be. They're the ones who, you know, gestate the babies for nine months and have to, and, and, and mainly in charge of childcare, especially in the first three years, up to 18 years. So they have more to invest. So they have to be pickier. Right. But on top of them being pickier, they have imperfect information. Am I uh, investing my time and, and, and effort into a man who's bad in bed, except, excessively jealous, insecure, low intellect, is faking his alignment, like yeah. he's going to beat you, faking yeah. how much money he has? So women, because they have so much, they need more data and they have such imperfect information. One of the ways that they can garner it, it, that, that information quickly is by looking at the choices of other women. So if you're a woman, if you're a man that other women choose, then they're going to skip a lot of those levels and those women are going to choose you. And so that's why mate choice copying um, is, so, is so incredibly powerful when it comes to uh, getting, you know, attraction for women. But there's one that that is above all, all, all others. And um, I've always known this, but it was Bolzerian in my interview with him where he expressed it. And I absolutely agree. And it's fame. It's fame. Uh, being famous is probably the biggest attraction trigger there is. Now, with that being said, most of us aren't going to become famous. But what you can do is become like what we we talk about in MOA is a local celebrity. Um, you go out on a date and everywhere you go, people recognize you and occasionally guys will come up and try to take pictures with you or whatever because you've got a nice podcast or you post some funny memes or you make some really cool TikTok clips or whatever it is. 
uh, you know, you're that guy who, who goes up and interviews people and like, Hey, what do you do for a living? You know, when all those people with the Lamborghinis and the nice cars, or you make prank videos or something like that, yeah. you have some level of status. Uh, there's a level of fame that existed, like in say 1985, where you were like Tom Cruise, uh, you were, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, like you were that level of famous, like 10 out of 10 famous, but, and then you were in television, movies, films, uh, maybe on billboards or you're a political figure or, or an athlete. And that was it. That's how you became famous. Now there's like this lower middle class of fame that you can get from having a hundred thousand subscribers on Twitch. And that middle lower level of fame didn't exist, but it's still incredibly effective when, as an attraction trigger. Right. And so that's what I try to teach guys to do. If you're on the fence, host a podcast. If you're considering it, have a panel show podcast. Absolutely fantastic. Do man on the street interviews, do reaction videos. These are easy ways for men to make content that can go viral very quickly and increase their status on social media. And also become a social media producer, not a social media consumer. Do not, people are like, oh, you must spend all day on social media. No, I don't. I try to stay off social media as much as possible, but I try to produce. Uh, I make 21 clips a week for YouTube. You, you crank them out. You and your team yeah. crank out a lot of content. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Would you say, Michael, fame at the top then status in like uh, uh well, I mean, fame is an extension of status right fame right. is a form of status just extreme status is fame right right um so it just depends on what you're good at if you're very charismatic you can actually be the charismatic guy who who steals the girl from the famous guy if you're super charismatic and you just know what you're doing money can be a benefit it often is a crutch and uh, it's funny because Bilzerian was actually considering, you know, he's going to do a course about this. Guys who are very wealthy, who don't get laid because they don't know how to use money to create a funnel to get women. He's going to teach that. That's not an expertise of mine. I don't use money to get women ever. Uh, but him being able to do it. And by the way, he he's never deliberately paying women or d directly paying women. What he's doing is creating a funnel through parties, yachts, uh, trips, private jets, et cetera, where the girls are then funneled into his life. And the girls just kind of know, like, hey, if you want to continue in this lifestyle, you need to, you know, show some validation to Dan, right? So that that's that's the way that works. It's an absolutely absolutely brilliant model, right? Brilliant funnel no, for him. I mean, the problem, what am I talking about? Brilliant model, the greatest model ever created. Amazing. As far as like a, a getting attractive women, yeah. Bulgarian created the greatest model of all time. Yeah. Are are most of those women at uh, Bilzerian's events? uh models different kind of influencers or are they kind of they run the gamut they, so, you'd say? so it, it depends yeah it depends on what we're talking about if we're talking about like an ignite casting these are going to be younger women who want to become professional models and they're you they're almost always in bikini competition shape ish um right. you know tend to be younger model type and look look good in bikini if we're talking about the parties they were also going to include influencers and other like guy influencers and maybe their girlfriends and just some other girls who are just attractive women in general, but maybe they aren't models, uh, but it just depends on what kind of event you're talking about. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible model for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, I, I recommend everybody, if you haven't, I think, it, I think you did two parts with those area and, uh, uh, it was just so much information. No, so, so we've done, we, yeah, we've done one, one interview, but we've also like, he's come on my, he comes on my calls on men of action sometimes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to, when, when his new product comes out, we're going to do another interview. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so Michael, you've spoken a lot about, uh, men of action and, uh, and by the way, guys, please like, and subscribe. There's amazing content. Uh, we're going to be bringing a lot more to you and also please make sure that you follow, uh, Michael on all socials. It's at Michael Sartain. Uh, just phenomenal, whether it's uh, IG, Twitter, so forth. And again, YouTube, incredible uh, information, MOA podcast as well. We'll have it all. They'll all be in the description. Michael, Men of Action is, it's an incredible community because what you're teaching, and I heard you recently as I was kind of twofold consuming the content to obviously just learn because I'm I'm working on on myself obviously but also getting ready for this uh for this show you talk about MOA being it's a combination of and correct me if I miss anything you're teaching leadership you're teaching I believe networking social skills high 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 status social circle game I think I covered it there kind of the in the 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 grand scheme um, talk a little bit about your program and what exactly you guys do, because I think, I think what you guys have tapped into is just really amazing. 
I don't, uh, it's really unique and it's helping a lot of men. I think it really is. Uh, what's the question? So just in terms, if you could talk a little bit about your, your program, Men of Action. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Men of Action was uh, basically the program created that where 25 years ago, I wish I could have given this program to myself. Men of Action is a program that teaches men. There are some women in the program, by the way. They're, they don't pay for the program. They just come on our free calls. I invite tons of like uh, tons of models onto these calls to, to give their two cents about things. But uh, Men of Action is a course where men learn to be better communicators. They learn to be better leaders. They don't learn to be better networkers. And they learn to be better in the dating scene. In Men of Action, if you don't, if you can't replace your girlfriend, your friend group, and your network, and your job in 15 minutes, you don't have enough abundance. And I teach you how to have those things along with you being the connector in your friend group. Every guy, every one of your guy friends should be meeting their girlfriends through you. Every one of your female friends should be meeting their boyfriends through you. Every one, one of your friends should be getting job recommendations from you. You should be writing out job recommendations. You should be the connector. Like literally you should be the one putting people together constantly uh, to provide more value to everyone in your life. And when you do so, the world just flows, bro. I can't explain it to you any better than to just say, like, you just freely flow through the world, just collecting incredible people, unbelievable advice, and making outrageous amounts of money when you just do what I say, which is provide value to a ton of people, become this incredible connector, but at the same time, still being able to be a great communicator, a great networker, a great, um, a great leader, and then also really good in, in the dating scene. Awesome. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Could could you give an example of a, a someone maybe in the program? You know, obviously you don't have to be specific, but in terms of any name or anything like that. But just someone that through something action that they took, <laughs> no pun intended there, but you know the uh, they were able to maybe not. I mean, obviously a, a huge uh, we're we're all obviously a big motivator is to attract beautiful women, but maybe, maybe they, they created, they opened the door for a business opportunity or a job opportunity, just from something, an action that they took, because you, you talk a lot about, you know, putting on high status events, so forth. If you have an example, you could share. Yeah. I mean, I have infinite examples. And if you guys want to go to school.com, it's S K O O L dot com forward slash men of action free. There's a hyphen in between every word, men of action free. If you go on there, there are Instagram testimonials and regular testimonials from guys who will tell you exactly what happened. Um, it's everything from a grandfather to a guy who's under five feet tall uh, to a guy who is uh, basically he's an Indian guy who just uh, wants to date white women. Like any kind of those limiting beliefs that you have, there's a guy in the program who conquered those beliefs by using our system and have incredible success. Um, I have some a part in the in Men of Action, where I go over how to go through a job interview. Uh, it's, it's, it's about being incredibly sharp and seeming motivated. I have several guys in the program who've gotten their jobs that way. Several people who've used the techniques as far as our Zoom calls and their podcast formats in order to grow their business. I have one guy who's an accountant. He started hosting Zoom calls, and now he has more business than he knows what to do with because he understood the scalability of using social media. And then a, a number of men who maybe have gone through a divorce or a going through a custody battle and in doing so they don't really have the guidance and leadership they need in order to understand how do I go forward? I haven't been in the dating scene for 10 years. What do I do now? Things are so different. What is this TikTok thing? I don't know how to use this. And so we're here to help you get it when you get back into the dating scene. That's another thing we help you with as well. So as far as uh, the majority of it is networking and dating, but we also will help you in, in cases. And by the way, just to let anybody know, if you're mainly trying to join the course for business advice, that is not somebody we're looking for to join the course. We're looking for someone who's majority looking for networking, dating advice, but there's also a little bit of business stuff in there as well. We don't, we like, we don't promise an ROI like some business courses do. That's, that's something we may pivot into in the next couple of years, but right now that's not what we're offering. Amazing. It's very, it's bad because we have a lot of guys that'll come on the course and they're like, I just want to learn to make a hundred K a month. Um, and it, the funny thing is we have clients who actually ha accomplish those goals using what we teach them, but that's never the priority because we can't offer that. We can't put that in our offer. We can't promise that. Sure. We can only promise that you're going to like outrageously expand your, right. uh, your social life in the next, you know, 20 days. Right. But as you become better and you learn about abundance, obviously, as you mentioned, you can attract more into your life so that it can be a natural uh, benefit of it. So in closing, Michael, I wanted to just, uh, again, thank you for, for taking the time out today. You talk a lot about gratitude and I think it's, I, I really believe in that as well because it's, 
it's easy to get caught up in the here and now. What am I doing today? What's going on? And and you talk a lot about, you know, having gratitude. You also talk a lot about, you know, doing charity and so forth. If you if you could just take a moment and and share a little bit about why that's important to you. Yeah, gratitude is the probably the most important thing that you can possibly uh, have like so for instance when people are suffering from depression you just come to the realization you live on a planet where half the world lives on one dollar a day or you live in a planet like you, there, you have access to broad spectrum antibiotics like suffering human suffering was horrible before the last century uh, compared to how it is now you should have gratitude for that the second thing is you should come to the realization that you're going to die you're mortal this too shall pass memento mori like you are also mortal uh, and when you do so, you see the impermanence of life, which should cause you to take action and take more risks and to be more willing to be rejected because you're just, because you're going to die. You, no matter how incredible you think of like Henry VIII, right? Think, consider where he is. Uh, he died of gout. Someday you're, you're dead. He was the king of England and you're just somebody, you're just a nobody and you're both going to end up in the same place. When you come to that realization, it's very freeing. And lastly, this concept, like no one cares what you do. There's no... This is a, an added feature or bug that's in society today is that nobody pays any consequences for their actions anymore. You can pose nude and become a, a political official. Uh, you can steal from the government and do tax evasion and become a famous movie star. You can, you know, change your gender and commit, you know, homicide and then event, event, eventually be named woman of the year. Uh, you can fuck a porn star while your wife is pregnant and be elected president. Like there's no, there's absolutely no consequences for your behavior. So in doing so, that should be freeing and also knowing that you're going to die and also having gratitude for your situation. It should, you should be able to go through life with just, just a thankfulness that you get to do this, that you get to live this experience. And there's, it's so freeing. It's so liberating when you come to the realization that nobody cares what you do. You're all of you watching this are basically trees in the forest where nobody can hear you. People with like fewer than a hundred followers on Instagram telling me that they're afraid to post a meme. It's just so arrogant and neurotic. Like anyone cares what you're doing. Most of you right now listening to this, you don't, no one cares what you're doing. And part of the reason why you're having problems with attraction with women is because of the fact that you care so much about what other people think. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. Appreciate yeah. the time. And uh, again, uh, if you want to just share that the site again, uh, first of all, you can connect with Michael at Michael Sartain. On yeah, at Michael platforms. Sartain on Instagram. Yeah, I'm Michael Sartain on all platforms except for uh, Twitter. It's going to be Sartain Podcast. Uh, you guys absolutely hit me up anytime you want um, on there. Uh, I'm going to push you towards the school server. That's where our community is. It's school, S-K-O-O-L.com forward slash men of action free. There's a hyphen in between each word. Uh, and then also, if you guys are interested in learning more about the program that I just uh, told you about, we have 850 guys that have gone through the program so far or are currently in the program. Uh, it's going to be moamentoring.com. You can find me at moamentoring.com. And if you guys are skeptical and you need more evidence, go to the school server and then go check me out on Instagram. And if that's not enough for you, then you are just blind. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the time. All right, Fabian. Thank you, brother. All right.